Hello and welcome to this webinar on winter grazing for the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Central Otago Farming for Profit program. I'm Nicola Chisholm from Ag First and I'll be the facilitator for today. The purpose of this webinar is to provide tips and tricks to help you set yourself up for a successful winter. Speakers will include myself, Tom Orchiston, who's the Environment Capability Manager for Beef and Lamb New Zealand, and Helen Thodey, who works for Dairy New Zealand as the Manager of Animal Care Team. Laura Lake will be working as the technical host, so you may periodically hear instructions from her as well. The intensive grazing of forage crops over winter is becoming an increasingly complex task and requires careful preparation and attention to detail. Decisions around choosing where you grow crop are no longer solely driven by pasture renewal, and how crops are grazed is no longer solely driven by animal performance. These factors need to be carefully balanced against good environmental and animal welfare outcomes. There are three key aspects to achieving successful winter grazing. There's the technical component, which includes all the things you need to do to ensure that animals perform well over the course of winter. I'm going to go through a bit of a checklist to help you ensure you're on the right track with optimising animal performance, and I'll email you some resources after the webinar to provide more detail. Environmental considerations include avoiding any practices that could impact on water quality. It also involves understanding and complying with regional council regulations. Tom will outline the current regulations that apply to winter grazing in Otago and allude to what changes we can expect to see in the ORC's upcoming water quality plan change, as well as showing us what good management practice looks like. Animal welfare is ultimately about making sure animals are happy, healthy and well cared for. The welfare of animals on winter crop received much scrutiny in the media last winter, and we can expect to see more of a push to improve practices in future. Helen will talk about the outcomes of last year's winter grazing task force and some areas that require specific focus. You'll notice that many of the practices outlined today will have multiple benefits. It is possible to possible to achieve really good levels of performance whilst also meeting environmental and animal welfare requirements, hence why the circles on this diagram overlap. So let's talk about animal performance. Winter crop is expensive to grow and supplement is expensive to produce. These need to be allocated in the correct quantities to the right classes of stock and in the right way in order to maximise stock performance whilst minimising cost. This requires planning and attention to detail. Each of the these five factors must be considered. Firstly, feed planning. This is all about assessing overall supply versus demand for the winter period. Here we're working in terms of quantity of dry matter. Prioritising feed is about looking at the quality of each feed type and matching this with the requirements of each stock class. The success of the whole system relies on transition. Management of stock during their first two to three weeks will influence their productivity over the whole winter. Supplement must be carefully selected and allocated correctly in order to balance animal performance and feed costs. And lastly, the wintering system can increase the risk of animal health issues, including mineral deficiencies such as iodine and phosphorus, and disease such as clostridial diseases. Talk to your vet and make sure your animal health plan is up to date. Undertaking a feed budget is particularly important this year, with many people finding that they are stuck with extra stock on hand. To undertake a feed budget, you'll need good up-to-date information, including crop yields. Undertaking crop yield assessment is essential. Please don't guesstimate. Knowing your crop yield is vital for feed budgeting and for successful transition. Ideally, get an independent person to do it, someone who doesn't have a vested interest in what your crop yields. And if you are taking a DIY approach, please carefully read and adhere to the protocols on crop measurement that I'll send you after this webinar. It's always best to underestimate feed on hand and or factor in extra fit contingencies, such as adverse weather, a cold or late spring, finishing stock on hand for longer than anticipated, uh, or periods of higher feed demand, for example, use after shearing. Please also make sure you account for utilisation and be realistic about what you can achieve. Now, when calculating feed demand, the number of animals is obviously important, but so also are your objectives for their performance over winter. 
Are you aiming to put weight on? And if so, how much? Make sure you factor in live weight gain and additional feed requirements of animals that are pregnant when calculating feed demand. Once you've completed a feed budget, make sure you plan out which stock will be allocated each feed type and when each paddock will be grazed. At this point, you also need to factor in environmental and animal welfare considerations. For example, paddocks with heavier soils should be grazed when conditions are most likely to be favourable. Paddocks next to a waterway should be grazed last in order to minimise the amount of time when bare soils is exposed to conditions that might lead to runoff. Paddocks with better shelter should be reserved for the coldest months or the most vulnerable times, for example, after shearing. Transition timing is also important for some stock classes, for example, pregnant ewes. When allocating feed, make sure you consider the protein requirements of each stock class. Generally, the smaller, more rapidly growing stock classes require more protein. Lambs and R1 cattle will need the highest protein feed. For those of you that are grazing bulb crops, remember that green equals protein. That leaf contains almost all of the plant's protein. In fodder beet, for example, the leaf will typically contain 22-25% to protein, while the bulb only contains around 7%. By the end of winter, most of the leaf has typically disappeared. If the leaf is missing, you'll need to compensate by providing a protein-rich supplement. Transition. Yes, I know you hear a lot about transition, but here's why. When a ruminant's diet changes, not only do the microbial populations in the rumen have to adapt, but the animal itself must also adapt to using different microbial byproducts. This involves physical changes, such as elongation of the villi which line the gut. You can see on the right hand side is the lining of the gut, as you might see it if you um, dissected an animal. And on the right hand side are these villi which line the gut, that's a cross section of them. These are the surface areas through which nutrients are absorbed. Now the rumen bacteria change relatively quickly in response to a new diet, but the process by which the animal itself adapts to a new suite of microbial byproducts takes a bit longer. For example, when transitioning from a diet of pasture to a diet of fodder beet, these villi will need to elongate to adjust to the higher sugar, higher acid diet, and this process takes about two to three weeks. During transition to fodder beet, the microbial profile changes quite quickly, and if the rumen is not adapted to making use of the new byproducts, then they can build up to quite high levels. In the case of lactic acid, this can mean a reduction in rumen pH, causing acidosis. In dairy cows, poor transition can have quite dramatic effects, i.e. death. And in beef and sheep, beef cattle and sheep, poor transition tends to manifest itself as reduced and variable growth rates. Ideally, avoid transitioning ewes onto crop, particularly fodder beet, in the first trimester. You don't want ewes losing weight during this time as they need enough energy to develop a strong placenta, and that's really important for lamb birth weight. Significant issues can occur when transitioning ewes from fodder beet back to pasture at the end of winter, as this coincides with late pregnancy when the energy requirements of the ewe are much higher. Supplement. This season you might be cracking into two to three year old silage. How do you know if it's any good? Well, get a feed test. That way you can allocate your various supplement types to the right classes of stock. Again, match your higher protein supplements to the stock classes that need them. Young stock and multiple bearing use in late pregnancy, particularly those that are grazing bulb crops which don't have a lot of leaf left. Think about timing too. Higher protein supplements might need to be saved until later in the winter when bulb crops lose their leaf. Remember the function of supplement. Supplement is not a dilution agent for fodder beet transition. You still need to carefully titrate the amount of fodder beet you're allocating during the first two to three weeks. And think about feeding method. So whilst bale feeders are efficient and save feed, they do provide less opportunity for individual animals to feed. You might consider spreading it out during transition to avoid over or underfeeding supplement to individual animals during that time. Here's some key tips for dairy cows during winter. 
Firstly, always transition right up to ad lib intake to reduce risks associated with breakouts. Secondly, make sure you carefully allocate feed during transition and be particularly mindful of yield variation within a paddock. Take this into account when setting up breaks during transition. So if you've got areas of the paddock which uh, look like they're high, higher yielding than the average, you might need to allocate um, smaller breaks in this parts of the paddock and that's particularly important during that transition period. Also make sure you've got plenty of space, a meter crop base per animal is ideal um, and make sure you're carefully observing them during transition to make sure all cows are eating the crop and again um, some high fiber supplement is required to balance their diet particularly on fodder beef. Beef cattle, again transition up to ad lib intake ad lib intakes are required to achieve high levels of animal performance and you should be aiming for around a kilo of live weight gain per day on fodder beet. You, to do this you need to restrict supplement to only what they need. Remember they'll preferentially eat supplement because fodder, fodder beet is harder to eat and they'll consume more supplement than they need if you give it to them. This will increase the cost of your wintering system as well as impacting live weight gain. Um, remember higher protein supplements are required for those younger classes of stock including R1s and just a little quirk of R2s. Um, note that when you're changing from a pasture diet to a fodder beet diet their yield will alter. So yield might increase from say 50% up to 55% during the transition phase. This will mean that they may not appear to be gaining as much live weight during the first 30 days. So if you want to get a true feel for their life weight gain over the winter period, make sure you weigh them after transition at say 30 days and then again at the end of the grazing period. Key tips for sheep. Sheep are a little bit different in that they can't store dietary protein for as long. They need protein in order to metabolize the energy in the crop and this needs to be provided ideally daily or at least every two to three days. Keep an eye on your bulb crops during the winter. It, when the leaf deteriorates, a protein rich supplement will be required to meet their protein requirements. And again, this needs to be fed at least sort of every two days. Failure to supply enough protein to use, particularly in late pregnancy, will result in them metabolizing their own protein reserves. And this can result in low birth weight lambs. Ewes can also get sleepy sickness when grazing bulb crops in late pregnancy if they don't get enough protein. Remember, crops and supplements are expensive to produce. Get the detail right to ensure good levels of animal performance, otherwise you're wasting your money and compromising next year's production. Take note of what has and hasn't worked this year and incorporate it into your plan for next year. If you need some more detail, there's some great wintering resources available on the Beef and Lamb New Zealand and Dairy New Zealand websites. And I will email these um, some links to you on these after the webinar. I'll also post one or two of these resources on the Beef and Lamb Central Otago Farming for Profit Facebook page each day over the next two weeks. That's all from me. Our next presentation from Tom Orchiston will cover environmental considerations for grazing winter crops.